questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. GB News Breakfast, every day from 6am. Yeah, so describe the, con describe the contents of the letter for us, because it is quite strongly worded, isn't it? And it suggests that your property is empty. And what do they suggest yeah. is it's going to be used for? They, they say, as part of this process, North Northamptonshire Council is identifying empty properties and sites within the area with the aim of encouraging owners to bring premises back into use or to find alternative options for derelict sites. The resettlement team in North Northamptonshire Council supports asylum seekers and refugees across three different projects, Homes for Ukraine, Afghan resettlement and asylum dispersal. At present, we are seeing a considerable increase in positive immigration decisions being made in favour of asylum seekers. So basically, they, they're wanting accommodation. But who goes around and assesses whether these properties are lived in or they are actually empty? Clearly, Ted, no, no one had bothered to come and look at your house at all, had they? What do you want now? Because clearly you are both very shaken by this letter uh, and that, that letter that you received in response has not gone far enough. Do you want an apology? What, what more do you want to see? Well, she said here that she's, you know, I sincerely apologise, this Lindsay Bell Chambers. But I don't see... There was no explanation as to how they've come to say this property was empty, whether it was disused, whether it was unkempt... Or what? If you go back through the history of the property, it's it's not been empty. It's 11 o'clock. You're with GB News. I'm Polly Middlehurst. And our top story, the Chancellor delivered his spring budget today with a mix of tax cuts and spending reforms. He cut personal taxes to their lowest level in nearly 50 years and take, took another two pence in the pound off national insurance. Opposition parties, however, said expected rises in council tax will wipe out any benefits for households. Also in the spring budget, the non-DOM tax status will be scrapped, he said, and replaced by a modern residency system. The Great British pub will also get a boost from a freeze on alcohol duty. Also in the budget, child benefit threshold increasing to £60,000 a year and the five pence cut to fuel duty is locked in for 12 months. The VAT registration threshold goes up from 85 to £90,000 a year, while the pensions regulator will get new powers to make sure people with defined contributions are getting value from their investment. And there's a new ISA scheme with £5,000 a yearly allowance for investments in Britain. And NHS IT systems will get a £3.5 million upgrade. Now, Lord David Cameron has said tonight he's appalled to hear about the deaths of three sailors after what he called a reckless and indiscriminate Houthi missile attack on a vessel in the Red Sea. It's understood three other crew members are missing and a number of others are seriously injured. Around 20 people were on board at the time of the attack. It's the first fatal attack since Houthi militants, who are backed by Iran, started striking commercial shipping in the Gulf of Aden. In the United States, Nikki Haley has ended her long-shot challenge against Donald Trump to become the Republican candidate for president. The former governor of South Carolina dropped out after the former president meet her, beat her in 14 out of 15 contests on America's Super Tuesday. Just as Haley was conceding the race, Trump invited her supporters to join him and called upon Joe Biden to a debate in a post on his Truth social platform. The presidential race now looks set to be a Trump-Biden rematch in November's US election. 
And a quick update for you on that fire on the police station in East London. It's still raging tonight on top of the building. The roof is completely alight. If you're watching on TV, these are pictures from the scene where the London Fire Brigade has just told us 30 fire engines and 175 fired up firefighters are still there tackling the blaze. They also said in the last hour that four aerial appliances are now being used by crews to attack the flames from above. Residents are being urged to keep windows and doors closed if they live nearby. The cause of the fire still not yet known and incredible disruption, no doubt, tomorrow to traffic in Newham in East London where that fire is still raging tonight. For the very latest stories, sign up to GB News Alerts, scan the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Time now for Headliners. Hello and welcome to Headliners, your first look at Thursday's newspapers. I'm Andrew Doyle. Tonight I'm joined by the rather cheeky couple, Scott Capuro and Nick Dixon. Look how sweet you are. How are you both? Hmm. Uh, well, I'm, I'm not all right. I'm just getting over a cold, but I'm doing better than Scott because I'm not banned from Ireland. Yes, yeah, Scott. Don't breathe near me then. I'm fine. <laughs> I, it's past. It's past. He has to exhale, Scott. It's part of the respiratory system. The now, Scott, you annoyed. Uh, you got banned from a club I in Ireland, fired. in Dublin. I did, yes. I did a show Friday night. It went well. Saturday morning, I got a phone call. Even though you did well, we're firing you. Well. Because I did one and a half jokes about the Middle East conflict. That's all it takes. That's all it when, takes. So when, some, when will you learn? The war is my fault. Don't joke about anything. Uh, That's the solution. Apparently, I don't understand anything about Ireland. I'm like, what? Yeah, yeah. Never mind. OK, well, look, before we kick in, kick off with the papers, we're going to have a look at the front covers. So the Times is leading with We're Turning the Corner. That's a reference to the budget. The Telegraph running with Hunt signals the end of national insurance. As you can imagine, there's a budget theme going on. The Guardian, a last desperate act. <laughs> They've definitely taken a stance on that. <laughs> the Express, Britain ready for takeoff. They've gone the other way, haven't they? And the iNews, Labour rules out taxing wealthy to avoid £20 billion cuts. Finally, the Daily Star goes rogue. Fry-ups turn blokes into stud muffins. Who'd have thought it? Those were your front pages. <laughs> OK, now, obviously, all of the papers are running with the budget as the big, big story. So, Scott, the Mirror, what's their slant on this? In the Mirror, uh, the main points of the budget speech are mentioned. The national insurance cut, the 2P cut from the national insurance for workers that will mainly, mostly benefit middle class workers. Yes. The poor and the rich won't benefit because the rich don't need it and the poor are going to be screwed again on that one. And then on the, the non-DOM tax U-turn... Yes. I'm, really, I'm, I'm pro-DOM, obviously. During the pandemic, I bought a whip. I tried to make some money on, on the internet, as you know. I saw you uh, in there. No, I, yeah, that's right. You and, did pretty um, well. You did better than I did. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I own a whip now. And then um, the public spending uh, will be kept at a 1% in real terms spend... Uh, other things are... Uh, but they're raising the threshold for childcare. So if to 60,000. To 60,000. If you earn up to 60,000, yeah. it was 50,000 before. Oh, I thought it was 40. It was 50. And there's 50. So right. that's quite good for people with kids. It is. You know, Yeah. I, I don't know why you'd want to have them. But, and you know, 60 sounds like middle class to me, but I don't know. I that, mean, who knows what it is these yeah, days. Outside of London, who knows? But, but definitely the Mirror um, is, is taking a stance that they don't think this is good. The front cover has right. stagnant budget for a stagnant country by a stagnant and government. And tobacco will cost more and probably alcohol will as well. So you're well, out of luck. That's <laughs> that's always the case. Nick, yeah. uh, what do you make of this budget? Well, I, I sort of shockingly agree with the mirror for once because it is it is all very stagnant. Dominic Cummings put out an interesting post where he said, for people looking for a plan here, there isn't a plan. Mm. They've given up. Yes. The spads are just looking for their next jobs. There is no plan. It's over. So it's a very sort of non-event. And budget. what about this national insurance cut? We all stand to uh, save a little money. Actually, seventy five pounds a month. Not bad. Mm. Yeah. With an intimation that they might end up scrapping it. Mm. At, at yeah, they should scrap it. I mean, this, this idea, I think I heard Liam Halligan say today that why is wealth taxed only once and income is taxed twice. Right. So, yeah, they should get rid of it. But, yeah, it's, it's almost like £450 a year. Yeah, yeah. It's, not, it's not not that I'm against that. He did some funny jokes about Angela Rayner. That's always good. And her second homes and stuff. It's easy to mock. Yeah, yeah. why not? But, yeah. but The thing is that £900 we'll be saving each year with the, the two, two, two cent thingy. We'll yeah. probably spend on booze and 
And weed because we're so depressed. Well, there is about that. Being broke. Uh, to what extent, though, is this just teeing up for the election? That you know, that using the the budget as a way to sort of say, well, look, you... we're, we're going to give you a few goodies. They'll probably put out an autumn statement and give us a few more treats. They're just trying not to scare anybody. That's all. They're just right. trying to keep whatever stability they think they still have. Anything else, I think, would have uh, caused a ripple. The last attempt was just a disaster that you know. yeah but they've gone too far the other way because uh, hunt warned he said i want i want to be like nigel lawson but it's i'm going to have to be more like gordon brown it's like what is the point of the Conservatives? <laughs> are you going to be like Gordon Brown? Well, I mean, they took the windfall tax idea from Labour. They've, they've been poking Well, I know. They've done that just to mess with Labour. They had very large hands. I met him at the Hay Festival. Did you? Quite attractive in person. I okay. Think. Jeremy Hunt does not have large hands. Mm. There's normal. There was also... I saw him, though. Okay. Feel well, people, people might be upset if we don't mention there was also that uh, announcement. The first thing he said was he'd spend one million on the statue for Muslims who'd fought in the Second World War. Mm. Some mm. people thought it was, it was a sort of attempt to be like, hey, we're the caring, non-Islamophobic party. Okay. <laughs> well, I don't think that's going to really yeah. wash, is it? <laughs> Let's be honest really, about that. Yeah. Let's move on now to the front cover of the iNews. Obviously, they're... Also running with budget, but they're talking about Labour. Mm. Yeah, they've got Labour rules out taxing wealthy to avoid 20 billion cuts. It's a kind of weird... It's kind of a non-story, as Lewis would say, because there's nothing there. They're ruling out doing this. And it's all about how a Labour... They've had their non-dom policy stolen from them by yes. sort of some clever politicking from the Conservatives. So it's like, what are they going to do now instead? And the Labour spokesman said, well, well, we'll find new ways to fund the spending promises in due course and in our own time. <laughs> but what people are pointing out is that because uh, Hunt is not, he's not making a spending review yet until uh, before the general election... They're going to... Reeves, when, when Labour get in, is going to have potentially only weeks to come up with the yes. plan. And you, you can see how it, it has gone wrong in the past, sort of rushing a, a budget or a spending plan. I don't know plan. what you're talking about. <laughs> I'm just but saying it can go wrong. Neither budget has anything in there about people trying to climb the, the property ladder. There's no assistance for new-time buyers. There's no, tax, there's no tax reduction. There's, there's nothing to encourage people to Yeah, but you know, that generation is, is, hasn't got a chance anyway. It's over for them, isn't it's, it? It's over. That so, one? Right. How about ours? How about us? Oh, yeah. No, well, we, we were over a long time ago, yeah, Scott, yeah. let's be honest. Let's move on to the front cover of The Sun. Now, this is a di different story. Scott, have you got this? Yes. Harry's pants sell for $250,000. This woman, um, Carrie um, Royale, uh, says that she has some photos of Harry naked in Vegas that she's going to put on her private pay-for site. And she's going to say, oh, she has sold, uh, sold, uh, sold his pants for a quarter million. Now, am I right in thinking... So she... Um, no, I don't want to commit libel here. She was a dominatrix. She was a, domi and she was a dominatrix. Now she's a film producer, so you could say now she has non-dom status. That's Am I very right? good. Yeah. Am I, is this even on? I know. That should have been yeah. the headline. I know. You know, I should be writing these things. You should be writing. Them. Paid more than this. The thing is, I don't know why. I, I can't no. imagine that the story is accurate. Really? Someone but paid quarter million pants. for his pants? Well, he, well, we all saw the photos back in the day when he was partying in Vegas. They're he was still, I was looking at them earlier. They're still there, yeah. He was very drunk. Right. He was playing air guitar with, a, I think, a, a, a snooker cue or and something. And then he's, he's bent over a woman kind of leaning yeah. forward with his bum showing. But... They were always pixelated out, right? right. You know, very... Mostly. You know, yeah. One thing she did say, she says, uh, now she doesn't care because he's an idiot. She doesn't, she doesn't care about releasing them. And, he, and she says, Megan has sucked the life out of him. He's definitely boring and she's wearing the pants. So, I mean, she's not wrong. Though, oh, those are the pants. Nick, Nick, oh, those, those pants, pants yeah. Yeah, yeah. I thought it was illegal to post naked pictures of people because it's classed under revenge porn. Mm. And I, mm. I was under the impression that that's completely illegal. And if you're going to do it about a high-profile high person and be on the front yeah. cover of The Sun about it, isn't she going to... She you thinks she's going to make me... Oh, when it's someone who has no power, you can get away with it. He's not even, barely even a prince anymore. But that's, surely that's the revenge that. porn is about someone in a, in, in a certain position. I mean... This wasn't a sexual situation. Right, well. exactly. Or was it? No. I mean, she, but you're right, when you're selling on your only fans, it kind of becomes that, doesn't it? Looks it? Kind of friendly. He was with naked strippers. I mean, mm. if, if that's not sexual... But I mean, it's allegedly. allegedly. I mean, it's I'm, hardly the teddy bear's picnic, is you've it? You've never I mean, hung out with naked strippers before? Come on. I, I Actually, I haven't, Scott. It's, no, really? it's the one thing I haven't done. You're asking a guy with a, a PhD in right. medieval poetry. <laughs> can, I, can I just ask as well, just one more point about this. It's quite interesting that mm. she says the reason she's doing it is that in his autobiography, Spare, she didn't get mentioned. Oh. And she is a woman scorned, right? Mm. And the precedent of this is, is Edwina Curry, because when John Major wrote his autobiography and didn't mention her, she said, OK, I'm just going to tell everyone about our secret affair. <laughs> and she did, and that's yeah, exactly did, yeah. what happened. Yeah, so. Yeah. Don't mess with women. Yeah, always yeah. mention your most sordid affairs in your book. In or it could come back to haunt you if you don't. Exactly. You think she'd want to write a book and describe it the way she'd like? Because he might have described her and said she was a pig. And then why would she want that in print? Well, also, it's only one night. Can you really get a book out of one night? Well, maybe you can, well, actually. Yeah. Maybe. He was quite wild back in the day. If you suck it up, who knows what you can get away with. Let's move on to this story now in the Daily Star. They are also not going with the budget. Why would they? Ugh. It's not important, is it? Yeah.
What? No, they've gone with fry, fry ups turn blokes into stud muffins, which it's probably come from boffins knowing the star. Yeah. And what it is, it's based on a, 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 a study that's definitely un, unimpeachable. It was done on 104 heterosexual men and women, and they gave them a breakfast that was high in carbs mm. versus a sort of more fry up breakfast. Anyway, the people who had the more fry up type breakfast were more attractive, were rated more attractive afterwards. So what the science they, is in. Are they attractive because of what it does to their bodies, or are they attractive because the sight of them eating a particular meal excites women? I didn't no, you're going to ask me follow-up questions. I've just, <laughs> just been given it. Like women, <laughs> well, women like to watch men eat meat. That's what it sounds like. Is it, is it full English? Right? Well, if that's what the boffins no. are saying... It then. was... Um, the fry-up is, is fried meat. It was to do with hormones, I think. Was it? Is I don't it? know. Mm. I mean, let, look, sex hormones. It's really not the kind of story we need to get no. too exercised about, is it? Let's, let's just move on now. That's all we've got time for in the, front, in the first section. That's the front page is done. But do stay tuned for Brits ditching the NHS, drones replacing the police, and Labour are fat-shaming. You won't want to miss it. Nana Queer. Weekends from 3pm. So after his mad dash to see his father last week, Prince Harry predictively went on TV to talk about it. He gave his first interview to Good Morning America, whilst apparently being filmed by a cruise that were doing a documentary on the Invictus Games. He didn't disclose his father's diagnosis, but frankly, even the fact that he was on TV talking about it was concerning. No wonder they're keeping him at arm's length. This is what he said. How did you get the news that the King was ill? Um, I spoke to him. And what did you do next? I jumped on a plane and, and went to go see him as soon as I could. How was that visit for you emotionally? Um, look, I, 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 love, I love my family. The fact, that I was, the fact that I was able to get on a plane and go and see him and spend any time with him, I'm grateful for that. An illness in the family can have a galvanizing or sort of reunifying effect for a family. Absolutely. Is that possible in this case? Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, you know, throughout all these families, I see it on a, on a day-to-day basis. Um, you know, the, again, the, the strength of the, of the family unit coming together. Mm. He also said that he loves his family, but then he said that he had his own family in America. So which family does he love? The late Queen's last few years of life were marred with accusations of racism, which Harry later backtracked on, claiming that they hadn't actually used the word, so inadvertently admitting to gaslighting us all. But the Sussexes' stock is falling in the States, and the only thing that makes them interesting is their proximity to the royal family. And now the king is ill, Harry has even offered to muck in and take on official duties to help his father. Look, I want to see reconciliation and love and joy, but I'm afraid Meghan has yet to even speak to her father, as far as we know. And Harry didn't apparently even reach out to his brother. Whilst his dad might fall for it, I doubt William will be as soft. Good luck with that, Harry. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back to Headliners. I'm Andrew here. I'm uh, Andrew Doyle. I'm still here with Scott Kapoor <laughs> and Nick Dixon. And we're going to kick off this section with American news now, The Mirror. And it's going to be a rerun. It's going to be Biden and Trump. Mm. Scott, you must be excited by this. Yeah, in, in The Guardian, it says Super Tuesday's predictable outcome guarantees that it will be the, the election that 70% of Americans did not want, which is <laughs> Biden and Trump running against one another. Why? Nikki I mean, Haley pulled out today. Uh, she, Nikki Haley. She did. Yeah. She had won Vermont, but she still pulled out because she lost all the other 15 states. And she didn't get hardly any delegates in the states she did well in. Still, all the delegates went to Trump. Especially it's a shame because I was really hoping for a, a Trump Clinton rerun. Uh, yeah. That was really my dream. Um, it, the whole thing is a, a bit of a nightmare also because I think both men are so entitled and they both expect 
so to win so easily. They're, but they're, isn't it going to go down to the wire? No. Mm. I, I don't know. I don't think it you, is. OK, what do you think, Nick? No, the general election. No, no, no. Yeah. The actual, Trump's going to win massively if, of course, there's no shenanigans, because Trump is saying we've got to be too big to rig. Too big to rig. Have you heard this? No. He said we have to win, but not just by, but by a margin that's so big they can't do anything dodgy. And I'm not just, of course, referring to anything that we're not allowed to say, but, you know, ballot harvesting. There's all kind of postal votes, there's all kind of semi-legitimate uh, uh, techniques you can use. But Trump's saying he has to win so big that even with that kind of shenanigans, they still win. That's the goal. You're also trusting the polls here, and that didn't go well in 2016. I'm just trusting everything. There's, I'm just trusting the whole gestalt of the whole thing. Andrew, look at Biden's. Everyone in the country thinks he's too old to do it. That's been polled. The lawfare thing, interestingly, that's not necessarily going down well with the moderate, with the, with no, the sort of centrists. Not. They don't like what they're doing to Trump. So while some people, some states like Colorado have done it and some rogue people and they're trying to sue him for all he's worth, send him to prison, the, the average American looks at it and goes, nah. But well, he's and also, in Colorado now anyway, so it's Scott, that's, yes, that's exactly. something I wanted to ask you as an American. Is that every time they do this kind of thing, you know, try and take him off the ballot in Colorado, try and impeach him, try and, uh, you know, get, put him up in court... Mm. Uh, have him done for the... Makes him more powerful. He makes him more popular. Any more media attention. Why can't they... Look, look, they were never going to win that Supreme Court decision. It was unanimous. Right, right. right. Even, you know, the, the lefties... Uh, There's like, no way the Supreme Court's going to give the states that sort of power. It's more of a struggle over so power, what, really, what between is, those people. What I'm asking is, why is it? They must have known that the Supreme Court would not have ratified that. Right. And they must have known that this would boost... Trump's popularity, or I are they think, just that stupid? I think the Democrats are still a bit behind on that. I think they think if they show the truth, if they reveal Trump for who he is, it will destroy him. But it's never worked. No. It never will. He's still very popular amongst people. He was popular before, but they're even more angry now. They feel they feel like he deserves it even more than he did four years ago. So, and then there's this, this thing happened in, in Michigan. 100,000 voters voted uncommitted. Right. Uh, Biden won, but this, in second place were the uncommitted voters. They had spent $20,000, that's all, in a few weeks, and they put this uncommitted party together. And that may become a thing across the really? U.S. That scares me, too. Yeah. The uncommitted, they want a stronger response to the Middle East. They want Biden to uh, pull out his, to get rid of his support for Israel. They're basically the party that wants the Jews can, to die. That's pretty much what they are. Well, can I, well, I mean, I'm sure they would deny that. Um, <laughs> but can I ask you about that, Nick? Because Biden's getting a lot of flack from people who are saying he's too pro-Israel. We have the same thing with Labour politicians in this country, of course, who are actually getting threats for not calling for a ceasefire. Do you think that could be the thing that really scuppers him? No, I don't think it's, I don't think it's enough people to really scuffer him. But, it, yeah, it's impossible. The left, they can never be lefty enough for a certain faction of the left. We know this. But then he's also going to alienate other people if he goes anti-Israel. So, yeah. He can't I, win I, on he that can't, He can't win that one. I don't think that's really the main issue. There's a large issue. Muslim the, population the, in the US that are, the, that are yeah. promoting this. The economy is a much bigger issue. You know, Trump's winning... It looks like Trump might win a lot of the black vote because they're just saying, well, the economy is way better. Yeah. And he's winning Latino votes, which he's never had before, black and Latino votes. So that's going to make a big difference. Unless the Democrats can import enough illegal immigrants, of course. But basically, the, I think the economy is going to be a much bigger issue than Israel, though it is an issue, as you pointed out. And he's also run a kind of flawless campaign, if you think about it. Trump's just got bigger and bigger during this campaign. The other person that did well was Vivek. And you could argue Haley has increased her profile, though I don't know who actually likes her. But then all the rest of them, Chris Christie and all those people, yeah. are just so forgettable. But, 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 and obviously, but, and obviously but, DeSantis went, lost yeah. the, uh, but, but lost Trump the also, face. The, Trump supporters also want the, uh, no, the anti-abortion... Uh, element of it to be put in the Constitution. Yeah. They don't just want a law, they want a constitutional law. Well, not all Trump supporters. That's a certain they, they, side of it. He said that... He, he, he promised to put the Supreme Court justices on the court that would support that, and he did it, and that's why he's so popular amongst his core voters now. Yeah, it's a mixture of things, because a lot of MAGA is actually a liberal, basically liberal move, but then, then at the same time you have the, the right... It's a, it's a mixture of, you know... The... But who does he always well, it... say he, he's the best friend of is people that don't support abortion, women's rights issues. And is that at the moment just it's, it, it's people who don't want Biden in, which is actually a lot of Democrats as well. They didn't even want him to run because right. the man can barely speak. I mean, for goodness sake. It's difficult. All right, let's move on now to the Daily Mail. More and more people going private for healthcare, Nick. Yes, the great rush to go private. Number of Brits ditching NHS soars to all-time high as ailing hospitals battle eternal winter. Mm. Get ready for eternal winter. It does feel like that in this country. Isn't that so, like Game of Thrones? Yeah, yeah, winter's, winter's coming. Well, no, if it's eternal, it wouldn't be coming. It would just always be here, it's wouldn't always it? always there, right? Um, but it will save the Guardian in that uh, headline every year of NHS crisis this winter, because it's every winter. Anyway, so there's a 7% jump on the previous record of, uh, of people seeking private... Uh, health. It's 664,000 in the first nine months of 2023. And one shocking fact is that we're 15 years behind countries in terms of cancer survival rates, in terms of other sort of similar comparable countries, yeah. which is absolutely shocking. 
And the biggest increase here is actually business health care plans. It's people realizing our, our employees are going to need something because yeah. we're like America now, so you've got to have a health care plan. And um, that's where most of it's coming from. Whereas self funded admissions of things like bum lifts have actually gone down because people are going to other, <laughs> this is in the article, to other countries. So it's not actually people self funding so much as businesses saying you're going to need some sort of plan as a, an incentive. Yeah, I mean, there are advantages, aren't they, to going private, but there are also very clear disadvantages. Money. I mean, this is really about. You know, people who can afford I it. I can't speak negatively. I'm seeing my doctor tomorrow, and um, right. we're going to talk about my future health plans. So okay. uh, I think okay. the yeah. works pretty well, actually. People, massive hypochondriacs need private health care. So I'm not going to say we. I'll say we. So we can get scans, like, immediately the next day. But otherwise, we go mental. But can I, I mean, say one more? cut the waiting. It I mean, does. The waiting is absolutely important. It's an insane it? waiting. I mean, it's 7.6 million now in the NHS queue. And can I just say one more thing? This comes just on the day that um, Jeremy Hunt described the NHS as the biggest reason most people are proud to be British. Really? A socialist failing healthcare system is the biggest reason? Well, you say Shakespeare, that, Shakespeare, the empire, <laughs> anything I think, else? I think the NHS is, British, is Britain's proudest moment, I think. Yeah, but you're not even English, you're not even British. Why are you even yeah, here? They saved your life. Can we check no, your visa? Uh, what is this? No, I'm yeah. Italian, and their healthcare system is, is uh, comparable, but not as good. I think it works pretty well here, if given the chance and if funded properly. Well, that's Hang on, none of, are you even British? None of us British is. Are you British? Like, yeah. Because I'm, I'm, I want to know who's actually the proudest of the NHS as a British person. I'm certainly not. Are you? Yeah. I, I do support the NHS. I think it's great. Is it the thing you're most proud no, of? It's not the thing I'm most proud of. I think Shakespeare would beat it. But I think but the point is that the idea that someone who's on the poverty line can go and get treatment uh, for free is a, re a thing to be proud of. I think yeah, it's a really the idea, thing. yeah. Yeah, the concept is great. You anyway. know, when I first came over here, I, I um, hurt myself and I was living in Greenwich. And I walked down the street to the NHS and they repaired everything, didn't ask for an ID and gave me medication. Yeah. And it was all free. Yep. And as an American, that would be shocking. I was really... I'm, I'm still shocked. Yep. Yep. OK, let's move on now to a story about drones going to take over our police. I mean, that's a bit Robocop, is that right? Well, it is. Yeah, and it, it's strange. It seems, it seems predictive by cinema from 20 years ago, but it's actually happening that drones will send, be sent out for 999 calls instead of police officers to uh, speed up response times. And this is particularly for things like uh, theft and robbery, not for violent crime. But, yeah, but what will they do? Like, so the drones fly in, and I guess they've got their lights, and exactly. they're pretty scary. Well, what, did, what did they do when my husband was, was mugged and beaten in front of our building? Two police officers came along, they took all the details, they wrote them down, they left, yeah. and then two months later they told my husband it was his fault. <laughs> that really? He that he solicited the violence. So I think a drone could probably manage that and the save drones, money. They zap them with lasers. And Are they going to do they that? They kill them there? instantly. I mean, they, would... they tase it, it's kind of like, it incapacitates them. Yeah, they do. Uh, no, I'm making that up. But, no, but, but that drone, would actually be effective. Do remember the drones in China during lockdown in Shanghai? They buzzed around and said, give up your thirst for freedom. Wow. They could do that. They could, like, give up your thirst to live in a safe country or something like that. No, what they could do is they could say, put the weapon down, you have 20 seconds to comply, like yes. that guy in, in Robocop. That would work. I think they can be pretty scary, drones. They move very quickly. They, you know, oh, yeah, this is the future, a yeah. dystopian future of London. Well, it's, it's in utopian in a the sense, there'll be far less crime, but there will be drones buzzing around killing you if you isn't do anything. This, isn't this incredible, the, the <laughs> rapidity with which technology is moving? I say burn the lot and destroy all computers. Anyway, The Independent now. Is Keir Starmer's waistline the cause of his problems? Well, half of me is saying, because I've put on a few pounds lately, I'm, I'm annoyed about it, but it's Labour fat-shaming row after Peter Mandelson tells Starmer to lose a few pounds. So Mandelson was sort of giving a general critique of, like, Starmer, he's saying, look, he could shed a few pounds, he could also sort his suits out, they're not helping him. But he's not and, fat, is he? Well, according to Mandelson, he's he may be too fat to lead. And then Wes Streeting brilliantly came back and said, you know, I'm against this kind of fat-shaming, and let me tell you, we've seen the odd paunch on Peter over the years. So that immediately engages in fat shaming. Is that the rule? You can retaliatory fat shames are okay. I mean, and also, didn't he point out that Mandelson had a terrible moustache back in the day, which is body shaming of a kind, isn't it? Yes. No, I mean, th this is kind someone of... said that. I mean, look, th no, well, yeah, it wasn't. It was so someone pointed he out. He was quite thin when he was young, though, and I think he remembers himself that way. Yes, but what? I mean, look. Churchill was hardly svelte. Mm. It's not like you need to be skinny in order to be a leader who is popular. I think popular. you do now, though. Do Boris. You? I think I Boris think Boris Johnson. Maybe young people. Well, I think young people really. No one expects that clown to be skinny, but I think most Trump. young people. No, but he I did a lot young, better than Rishi. Who's doing better? I Boris. Just smashed. A sentence between you two. I think one, young people respond to weight loss better. Do they? Yes. I'm not do. so sure about this. I do. I don't think it's even fat shame. I just think it's factually wrong. I think Keir Starmer isn't fat. Do you know who should gain He's weight? Big. It's Rishi Sunak. If he gained a few pounds, he'd have more gravitas. Yeah. I think those skinny suits make him look like less 
Less. Yes. I think he should kind of spread out a little bit. Right, maybe. I okay. think he's looking a bit too slender. OK, well, you know, I don't, I don't care. I care about the policies. <laughs> Let's move they on now. They don't exist, though. They, no, that's true. It's a the Daily Mail time. now and uh, London's night, nightlife going down the drain. Who's got this? Well, there's a, a night czar that's paid £117,000 a year. You and I both know her, Amy. Amy LeMay. LeMay yes. Yeah. Uh, I've worked with her many times. She's a lovely woman. And Sadiq Khan made her the night czar to try to both respond and sort of beef up nightlife in London and make it a 24-hour capital city, as it already yes. was, as Amy said, but I'm just going to make it more that. Yes. And apparently uh, the reverse is true. A lot of pubs have closed. A lot of uh, venues stop serving drinks at 9.30. They can't afford to stay open. Yeah, it's not really 24-hour at all. Well, I, I mean, it must Bits be somewhere. It. I, yeah, it used to be near where I live, but three clubs that I know about in my neighborhood, in Bethel Green, have all closed since the pandemic. I think bits of Soho have been, but you have to pay extra, and I yeah. don't... You I know, think the gay nightlife has kind of diminished a bit, because... All clubs are mixed and nobody cares anymore. So I think that whole buzz about keeping gay club open until 1 a.m. doesn't really matter any longer. Nick, I don't know. Nick, you're a doing. night owl. I can't speak to the gay scene, but I do. I do know it's always been impossible to get a drink late in London. Unless yeah. you go to some weird place, the Phoenix Artists Club, or you find some weird place to go. I mean, that's a perfectly good the club. Phoenix club. Yeah, they're all right. If you belong to a private club, you're fine. Obviously, I think yeah. they're talking about public public. Space. Yeah, but there should be more places to to go to drink. You shouldn't have to knock on a door and give a password. It's the be. Hippodrome Casino where I'm doing where I do our live shows. It's almost impossible though. It's happened to me so many times without drinking. Everyone looks for a place. In the end, they just give up and go yeah. home dejected. But even and it seems as though heaven might close because they can't afford it. I think it's also that it's expensive to keep clubs open. The know? thing is, if you had like a conservative, safe culture and a safe city, that'd be one thing. But it's chaos and degeneracy. It just ends at 11 p.m. See well, what I mean? There's no, there's no upside to well, this. That, isn't that something you'd like, Nick? You know, that the if there was an upside, no, 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 because they could just go take to the street anyway. Really, I'm surprised right. because London feels so safe to me when I walk home from gigs, and I'm surprised there aren't more people out. It's such a great place to be. Well, they would be out if there were more bars to go to, I guess. I mean, this article is saying loads of them are shutting down, so you know the economy is down the drain. Okay. Anyway, we have made it halfway, but after the break, we're going to discuss: Is the menopause over medicalized? Three men are going to give you their opinion on that. <laughs> uh, the MP demanding apology from EastEnders and a football game forced to play inside due to abusive chants. Fascinating stuff. Stay tuned. Hi there, welcome to the latest GB News forecast from the Met Office. Yeah, there was some warm, sunny spells during Wednesday, but for many over the next 24 hours, it is going to be cloudy with an increased chance of showers developing through Thursday. We've got high pressure to the east. That's bringing a lot of low cloud into eastern parts. We keep the clear spells overnight in the south and the west. Where we do have the clear spells, there'll be a touch of frost and some fog patches forming. A few showers continuing across parts of Cornwall as well. Otherwise, many places will be dry. And we start the day with a bit of a chill in the air, certainly where we've got those frost and fog pockets in the west but it will soon warm up. The cloud will lift as well, and actually with the rising cloud, it's going to be a brighter day across northeastern parts of the UK. Still a lot of cloud, and that cloud bubbling up, some sharp showers will develop, particularly through the Midlands, East Wales, into later on parts of northern England. Away from the showers, though, plenty of dry and bright weather, best of the sunshine in the west and southwest, highs of 12 or 13 Celsius, although still a chill in the east. And it's going to be increasingly breezy through Thursday and into Friday. That breeze coming from the east will make it feel on the cold side, but increasingly sunny spells will develop in the south on Friday and it's going to be largely dry. Same can't be said for the weekend. Increasingly spells of showery rain will move north across the country, 8 Celsius in the north, 12 further south. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Big news, big debate, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. 
I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's Live here on GB News. Every Wednesday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's Questions when Rishi Sunak and Sir Keir Starmer go head to head in the House of Commons. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Welcome back to Headliners. It's your first look at Thursday's newspapers and the menopause. Is it... <laughs> I don't know why I said it in that <laughs> cheery menopause. way. Menopause! Is it over-medicalised, Scott? This is in the Daily Mail. Well, the Daily Mail says that it is. It's over-discussed, over-medicalised. It, it, it's dramatised and it's meant to promote and push drugs amongst women. And it's not that big a deal, some doctors are saying. Well, women say different. Women do say different. Women do... They rattle on and on. And so, also... It, it, apparently, um, some female doctors, you know them, they've said, don't downplay the symptoms. You know, you get warm and it's really bad. It's more about, the, the body just doesn't produce hormones anymore, so women just dry up. But, you know, throw meds at it and it'll sustain you for a couple more years, but it might make your bones brittle. So you gotta decide what you wanna do. You could drink dairy when you're older, make sure you hydrate, get some sleep and eat properly. Uh, that's always an option. But people want drugs, they want meds, they want the doctor to fix things for them. I mean, I don't think it's fair to, so it's over-diagnostic. I mean, it is a natural part of life, isn't it, Nick? Yeah, that's the point being made here. I think it's... it's, it's, it's don't demonise women just for a natural process of ageing. I, it's, it's, I think it's the point. But who demonises well, anyone for Well, I that? don't know. I don't this know. comes from the Lancet, who haven't got a great um, history with women, because they use the phrase bodies with vaginas on one of their covers. Did you know that? In 2021. Oh, and they also... It's um, always that they, well, they've not got a great history, and they also dismissed the COVID lab leak theory. They had a load of scientists get together and that's sign right. a letter. They it's said like, it was a racist theory. It turned out probably to be but true. a lot of people felt that way, though, at the time, to be fair. Well, and then, then it was a racist... A wrong. Wrong. Yes, they... Yeah, but then they, you know, they were well, wrong. They thought it was they impossible. Were wrong. <laughs> impossible that Ridiculous. the lab, the Wuhan lab created, you know, the yeah. virus lab created the virus. They yeah. thought it was impossible. Well, you Happy know, Chinese New Year, by the way. We could obviously talk <laughs> about the menopause all night, but let's COVID. move on. Um, <laughs> we normally do. OK, the Telegraph. Uh, football club playing without the fans. That's an e interesting thing. Mm. Yeah, this is Barry FC forced to play two games behind closed doors after abusive chance in landmark ruling. So uh, my mum's from Barry, so I have an interest in Barry. It, it, great place, great people. But you know what? This is a strange law. It's if the, if the fans or rule the fans are you know shouting homophobic and sexist stuff, mm. but then the club is punished and forced to play. Behind closed doors. I just don't see how this is really Does feasible. That mean no, no fans can go. They have to play the right. games without them. But how can they Why possibly them, police though? that? That's the thing. It's strange. Why punish the players? It, this feels like collective punishment, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But is that right, Scott? Is that fair? Well, I, I just, I, I just, you can't police it, and I, I just think they have to stop trying to police this. It's impossible. So there's something about football fans, and they, they, you know, they do become a bit weird and a bit mad and a bit yeah, mob-like. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, in a way, I don't really mind weirdly because I kind of think it's just a kind of letting off steam. Right. I don't but think it's, it's real. It's difficult with the players, though. There's that Brazilian player, and and and, and one ch one young person, a, a, a child, basically, recently was yelling. Monkey at him from the stands during the game. Well, that's outrageous. And he, he found it very distracting, and he's worried about injuring himself. And it, it's a terrible situation, of course. But they do make like three billion dollars a game, so maybe they can put up with it. I guess. Shouldn't we just punish the? Well, yeah, well, comedians would put up with a lot for for we some money. Do for 150 pounds. You get heckled. You get heckled with anything. You get told yeah. to kill and yourself. You don't for deal with the heckling. The audience quid. turns their backs on you, Manchester. So yeah, you got to deal with. I it. mean, but Nick, you know, we shouldn't mm. allow. I mean, uh, you know, no, it's I, if someone shouts something a racist thing, they should be punished. But why punish? Everyone. No, you can't punish the club. It's completely unworkable. Yeah. Completely, it can't, can't make sense ever. Very but there, this is you the world we're in. You can't punish everyone. I mean, you know, also, it ruins the, the game for everybody else. It's very strange behaviour. OK, the Metro now, an MP, is furious at EastEnders. I'm not really sure about this story. Apparently, they, they filmed an episode that meant, meant to be set in Milton Keynes. Yes. And it was with Patsy Palmer, who's lovely, and Shona McGarty and James Farrar, some of my favorite actors on the planet. I love the show. Of East, and, and, you know, uh, they go to visit Milton Keynes, and there's some stuff going on. And I guess they discussed it, Milton Keynes, uh, as, as I think Bill Rotty. Bailey does. Bill Bailey says he, he, that it's Satan's lay-by. That's, that's in Bill Bailey's act. But I think that they, yeah, they described it as grotty during the show or something. Yeah. 
And so this MP has decided to take it on and say it's not, and we're going to fight you on this, and we're going to sue the network, and we're I, going to... I mean, I don't want to be offensive to people in Milton Keynes, but it, do, it doesn't inspire me. It's very... It's, 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 it's American city. style. It's American yeah. style. Yeah. yeah, I mean, they're not wrong. I mean, look, EastEnders... Well, the strange thing about EastEnders I've always found as a, as a, myth, a sort of mode of escapism is that it's even worse than real life. Do you know what I mean? It's incredibly grim. Horrible things happening constantly. And then they make, they make Milton Keynes, presumably, even worse than Milton Keynes already is. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, most of the UK is a dump now, except from parts of the Shire. So is it really that offensive. Is Milton Keynes where Abigail's party is supposed to be set? Pretty is it? Much. Like, pretty much, I It's think. where they shot Was it even uh, invented, Superman then? 4. Superman 4, The Quest for That's Peace. That's a weird oh, fact. Right, right, is, right. is filmed in Milton The Quest for Peace. I like you, you even have the subheading. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> four, it's, it's there. It was very new. I shall know. The Quest for Peace. The thing is, I, I think people get very sensitive and fragile about their own towns. They do. Most people don't care even though that they're there. They do. Relax. They do. OK, let's move on now to <laughs> the Daily Francisco, Mail. I guess I'm lucky. Uh, we're moving on, Scott. The Daily morning, Mail. Morning, Rio. And the woke have caused fury planning for the Paris Olympics. Nick. Yes, fury as Paris Olympics poster removes Christian Cross from Napoleon's tomb as fans considers allowing a Saudi Olympic village to be set up at the famous landmark. So what happened is there was a picture here of the, the Olympic village grounds on the... the uh, oh, is that what the picture is of? Yeah, the Los Envelines, something like that. Yes, that's right. Very bad pronunciation, but... The thing is, they took out the cross. Now, this is, the, the artist was Ugo Gattoni, and he's saying, well, I just did it in a way that came to mind with no ulterior motive. But it is a bit weird. I've looked at it, and suddenly it's not there. As you can see now, it's on the screen. It, it, it's just not there. It's like, why take off the cross? And in the atmosphere we're in now, where Christianity is so hated and so under attack all the time, you go, why do that? So why did they do it? Well, he's saying, no, he, he claims it's a general surrealist impression, a, a celebration of that area, and he's not really... He was just, you know, he's, it's an artist's impression, if you like. Yes. But it does seem a bit pointed to remove the cross if it's there. Well, I support artistic freedom. It just seems like an odd uh, thing to do, Scott. I, I think they told him to do it. Do you think? Obviously. Yeah, he's, he's clearly made... They're making a point. But what, what point is that? They're saying that we're non-denominational, don't worry. Well, the French do not like public religious figures, but it's a church. They're very yeah. secular, aren't they? Everything's got to be secular. Be... But that, as they're pointing out here, the irony of that is that, you know, you're going to allow the, the, the Saudis in to set up their Olympic village. It's not exactly secular. I don't secular. feel like Christianity's under attack, though. I feel like they're as popular really? as they ever were, kind of. I mean, people Depends like, you like are, it, people it? that don't... Oh, I guess. Yeah, in the break, you were attacking the pro-life movement. I mean, if, if you hate Christianity, how, how, you wouldn't I'm notice. I'm attacking and I'm just saying that I don't support it. Well, but if you didn't, if you already don't like, you know, if you hate Christianity, you wouldn't notice it was well, under what's attack. What does Christianity have to do with little embryo eggs? Christianity has nothing to do with... I'm just saying you wouldn't notice with, it. With, you know, I think human this is a separate debate where we're steering into. No, I, 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 <laughs> no I, I take umbrage at this. I don't... I don't I, I'm, not, I'm not blanketing everybody that I... I what, what I have a problem with is marketing Christianity as something that's... that's something that's, uh, you know, as uh, using it as a weapon to attack people. I don't like that at all. No, well, the argument here is they're using it as a weapon against Christians, which we see That's how constantly yeah. in the culture. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's move on anyway, uh, because we have to go to a break now. But in the final section, we are going to be discussing snooping parents in schools, Apple's new divisive emoji range, and sad news about one of the world's greatest artists. Don't go anywhere. I'm Nigel Farage, and this is GB News, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday from 7 p.m. Well, we've been a constitutional monarchy since the late 17th century. And of course, part of that deal is that the monarch, or indeed the close immediate royal family, should not interfere with politics that in any way could be seen to affect individual parties. Now, perhaps one of the most classic cases in the 20th century was Edward VIII, who during his brief reign went down to Merthyr Tydfil in South Wales, met thousands of people who'd lost their jobs in the steel industry. In fact, he shook so many hands in the end, he had to change and shake with his left hand. And he said something must be done to get these people jobs. It was taken as a direct assault on the Conservative government of the day. And we could go on to Edward Heath, as many saw it, using the Queen to get us to join the common market and things the Queen said uh, during the referendum on Scottish separation. And we could, of course, could talk about King Charles, who was Prince of Wales, endlessly talked about climate change and net zero. But the intervention overnight from Prince William, I think, is the most direct Politically, a political piece of interference that has international and global implications that I almost think we've ever seen. Prince William is saying to Israel, stop 
what you're doing. Some will see that as being given a free pass to Hamas. Many young people will say, hooray, he's doing the right thing. But whether he's doing the right thing or not, has he gone just too far with this? Should our future king intervene in this way? I don't believe that he should. I think he's making a very big mistake. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back to Headliners with me, Andrew Doyle. It's your first look at Thursday's newspapers. We're going to kick off this section with the Daily Mail. And the new emojis are here. New gender neutral family emojis are added to the Apple update. There are also emojis now uh, for other, uh, they've updated with other things. Yeah. Uh, including, oh God, I, I circled this now, I can't find it. Oh, uh, limes, uh, brown mushrooms, broken metal chains, yes. two shaking heads. And four, count them four, because two's not enough, gender-neutral families. Well, we can see them on the screen there, and I don't really understand how that's different from just a silhouette of any No family. one knows, and I don't know why it's even important, but there were two people interviewed of opposing views on yes. this. Of course, they, they can always find them. They're both girls. One is Kelly J. Keene. She's from the leader of the Party of Women. She's claimed it's an attempt to push the transgender ideology. And who's the other person? The other person is Cleo Madeline from Gendered Intelligence. Claims it's, quote, good to have better representation of gender minorities because it helps those people communicate, but it doesn't really, does it? But I don't even understand. It's not... I can't see what their gender no, I, I, identity no, is. It's a silhouette. Seems, just a series of blobs, wasn't it? It's was it, very it seems, blobby. It seems, in a way, it seems, it seems camouflaged. It seems worse than just showing... It just becomes very generic. I thought it was going to be one that... You remember that, that guy with the belly, the pregnant... Yes, who looked like Bill man. Gates? But I, I thought it was going to be like that, but it's just, just or nothing. Or maybe it's just a comedian that won the, see, the prize. Is, exactly. Like horns so in it, yeah. travel chest There set. was a pregnant man emoji, and then also there was a salad bowl emoji. Emoji, and right. the vegans kicked off, so they removed the egg from the salad bowl. Right. Why are we having loads of debates oh about God. emojis? It does seem a bit odd. Just show a guy with boobs. That's what we want to see anyway. OK, interesting. <laughs> Let's move on now. Uh, this is also the Daily Mail. A school has got a controversial method to check up on its students. Mm. This is mental. Astria Academy head teacher David Scales said in a video that staff have been visiting people's homes to crack down on unauthorized holidays during term time. Yeah. So this is incredible. So they're going through bins. <laughs> I mean, what? yeah, no, we, we all know Lewis Shaver does it, but they're, they're oh. out there going through the bins, checking your doorstep, checking if there's cars in the driveways and if the lights on, if steam's coming out of the boiler. And the, the reason for this is that <laughs> parents are calling in sick. Sometimes they're pretending to be doctors. Mm. It's yeah. hilarious. It's like something in Ron Burgundy we do in Anchor. It's like, hello, I'm the, clearly the doctor. But it's, it's just the parent calling in sick. And they, they do things like they change the name on the phone to doctor's surgery. It, it, a bit Wait, generic, a bit of a giveaway. It's illegal, can it? This is to, to all to get out of... You know, so you can have a holiday in turn time. Now, I'm sure when I was a kid, you could just have a holiday. Yeah. But now yeah. you're not allowed... Well, yeah. yeah. where I'm from, it, it was it different rules. It can't be legal. Because, that, you know, that's village. straight out of that film, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, where the headmaster goes round to his house to check if he's feigning sickness. But they're worried about the kids. That's why they say that they're worried about what's happening to children if they, if they don't know where they are. Yeah, but you can't go through someone's bins. I think... I'm pretty sure well, the police would have something to say about it. they are. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you're a teacher, you can. Yeah, yeah, you can. They like it. They're a bit bored. They want to, you know, throw their weight around. I, I just don't think this... I can't understand it's this. It's very disturbing, but you can see why parents have lost respect for schools after lockdown, because we were told in lockdowns, education doesn't matter, schools don't matter, and the teaching unions behaved appallingly, so they have, you know... Maybe they're trying to make up for that, maybe. Yeah, yeah by checking bins. The other, being aggressive. The other thing, though, is that holidays 
outside of term time are much more expensive. I mean, significantly more expensive. If you just go a week once the schools are back, you can save a fortune. Yeah, and some of these families need yeah. to save a fortune, yeah, right? Yeah. So it's not that unreasonable. To right. Say. And what are they really going to miss? I mean, our education is so bad anyway. <laughs> I think take the holiday. Their right. kids are already stupid, so why not? Right. That, right. They're never going to learn. Yeah, it's I mean, too late. If, if, I think that should be the point. If your child is just naturally stupid, yeah. Yeah. you should be able to miss as much. Let them run free. They're yeah. never going to. They're never going to learn. There's no yeah. point. Yeah. Let them be like. Yeah, William Blake. Just let them run out. In the field. And maybe they'll go away and leave you alone. Maybe. I mean, if they're not going to make any money for you when they're older, just let it go. Right? Yeah, let it go. Like the French, you know what they do when they go on, on vacation? They drop all their dogs off. And if you drive through the city of Paris during summer holiday, you'll see a bunch of random dogs running. And they used to be owned. Just running around. The French is so weird. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> one step further, kids are half dog anyway, aren't they? So. That, is, that is true. OK, let's move on now to the Telegraph now. Kids are half dog, you just said. <laughs> that phrase is going to stay with me. Anyway, uh, bumblebees are just like humans, Scott. Right. A uh, demonstrator bee uh, set tasks. They, they, they pass on techniques to one another, and they can do things like they can be trained to push things. What? Yes, they can. Like the Krypton factor? A little bit, yes. But like, I don't know what that means, but yes. <laughs> Researchers at Queen Mary University of London showed that bumblebees can be taught to nudge a lever and then okay. spin a floor plate to access a reward of sugar water. They are going to eat, they're gonna, our, they're gonna eat our eyes when we're dead and run the world in 10 years. So n never mind AI, yeah. the threat is actually bees. They're gonna push the button and the bomb's gonna go. So, uh, Nick, uh, so bees can solve problems. I, mean, I don't mm. think they have sentience in the way that, say, a pig does. Hard to I, prove, though, isn't it? Yeah. They don't even know how they fly, do they? No one can understand how a bee flies. You, you realize that's not even been cracked. It's never mm. been figured out. Is that out. true or an urban myth? Is no, it it's real? true. Is they don't real? know how it Well, there was an urban myth that it came from acoustics, but apparently that's not true. But no one knows how they do it. I've got all these tweets now. Yes, this is how you do yeah, it. Here's the link. A lot of that. But I'm claiming no one knows. But, but the bees can solve puzzles. They work as a high, they work right. as a collective right. mind, right? Yes. right? I hate bees. I think they're absolutely awful how because they're fantastic. Well, I was attacked by a bee. No, right, and they, it was colliding repeatedly with my head. When was this? It was about two years ago. And the thing about it is, is if it collides with your head, it's summoning the rest of the... You have to get right. out of there because it's summoning the rest well, of the... Well, where were you? Near my yeah. house. And what did you do to it? Absolutely nothing. It was unprovoked. You say that. That's my rage about this. It was an unprovoked attack. And if you mm. kill the bee, that's even worse because they sense where you've killed it and they come to the scene right. of the crime. Oh, right. And then all those lefties will get you for killing bees because you're not allowed to have a protected species. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. a minefield. There's no yeah. way out, isn't no, it? No, there's no way out. Yeah, I don't yeah, like it. Yeah. There was a bee came into my house at Christmas. And I don't trust that either, because if a bee comes into your house at Christmas, it's woken up way too early, or it doesn't respect hibernation, it's going to be angry or Are you all right? You've got a fetish. I, I, I'm just angry. You must you... prefer them to wasps, though. Yeah, yeah. No. That's the point of the wasp. No, the wasp is a, a fine beast. Are you serious? Yeah. You're pro-wasp? I'm pro-wasp. Oh. That's how it is. That's your you worst view. Pigeons? Do pigeons attack you, too? I, I, all, I love all creatures except for bees. All right. But pigeons do attack me. They do, now. I they, thought they. They, they, do. they do. Let's move on to this next story now. This is the Daily Star. A Bible prophecy about to be fulfilled, Nick. Yeah, Bible prophecy to be fulfilled as red heifers from Texas are secretly moved to Jerusalem. And this is Yishtak Mamo. I don't know. I don't know. How the heck do you say his name? I'm English. I don't know. Thank you. Thank you. I can only say Steve and names like that. So fervent believers of this prophecy believe that the Bible's book of Numbers commands the Israelites to offer a red heifer without defect or blemish, and there's never been under a yoke. And so he's trying to fulfill this prophecy by They've transporting the cows. Yeah. To, because yeah. this is the, the, a lot of fundamentalist Christians in America want to support Israel because mm. they believe that once uh, they convert all the Jews in Israel, then that will be the end of the world and they'll all have the rapture. It's so also I, the Holy Land, that's why too. Well, there's that as well. But I didn't think that shipping in uh, cattle was part of the deal. It's the next step, isn't it? Is that right? It's baby steps. Are there any other yeah. crazy things they have to do at this point? I, yeah, I, I think I think someone's someone's child's going to have to be sacrificed. So. No, well, they say they're going to have to sacrifice one of the cows. Well, they say that. Is that how this is going to work? They'll spray paint cow on a kid and just kill it. I don't know what they're going to do. They're all mad. They're out of their minds. I mean, they're crazy. this is such a strange story. It's, it's, it's the dark web. Is that where they got it's, it from? That's the dark web. I, I just Anyway, let's move on now to our final story of the night. Um, this is some sad news. One of the world's greatest artists has uh, passed away, Scott. Mm. Well, Pig Casso was a pig who, who, whose lifetime of paintings fetched a million dollars. Yes. Uh, after she was saved from her slaughterhouse, has died in South Africa. Owner Joanna Lefson <laughs> uh, announced that Pig Casso, who had contracted rheumatoid arthritis and whose, whose paintings had become less... There's the pig. Yes. Um, now is dead, and so now the paintings are worth more, as it turns out. What do you think of that painting, Scott? Do you, as an art critic, would you, do you think that's any good? 
Um, mm. I mean, I don't know what it says. It's, I don't know what it not, represents. It's not worse than most modern art, is it? No, right. Because it's ever, ever since Duchamp, Chirino, Andrew, basically all art has just been this dialectical nonsense. Instead of actually being beautiful, it's all basically looked like that. And I'm Duchamp was, in the was nose doing me. a joke, wasn't he? Yeah. He was. Well, he was saying like anything can be art now. It's over. Yeah. And he was right. You look at. I mean, you look at that. It's as good as most things. It also looks like a Jackson Pollock. And apparently he was. He was a CIA. The pant. ground does look like Pollock, actually. Yeah, yeah. Near the painting. He's standing on a Pollock. Yeah. I think the pig's groundwork is is far better I than its snout. So. You're right. Yeah, yeah. Would, Have you seen that cool. elephants can paint, can't they? But I'll, I'll yeah. let me put you in the shot there. Elephants can paint, <laughs> but can they really, do they know what they're painting? They're quite intelligent, but do they know what they're painting? Well, this is the thing. You know, there was that story a couple of years ago, a few years ago, where uh, some little girl had gone into a mother's art studio and daubed some paint and it ran and they sold it for something like £50,000. Mm -hmm. And you just think, art has to mean something, doesn't it? Or it has to... To the painter it does. I mean, or the creator. My, my ex, yeah, well, my yes. ex, Fat Matt, was an artist. He was, in fact, he was bulimic, but I called him... Fat Matt, it was kind of a control thing. He he took his art very seriously because yeah. somebody had to. But when he showed it to me, <laughs> it just looked like cartoons to me. Yes, you so know, it mattered to him. Yeah, and he drew a self-portrait of himself that was his head on my body. I thought he was psychotic. He was a bit, I, th I think he killed somebody. I mean, somebody. That's, that's a bit of a Jeffrey Dahmer moment, if, yeah, I, if well, I'm honest. I think you move, the hell out, you, you move yeah. out at that point. I woke, up, I woke up next to him one night, he had a pan over my head, like he was going to take a swing. But in the meantime, I think his expression, his art expression, was the only thing that saved him. So yes. this pig might have lived this long, because it painted. Maybe we should all become painters that extend your life. Apparently. I just don't think, by your own definition, I don't think that pig can be an artist because it, that, that painting can have no meaning for the pig, can it? Mm. This question does it have to be meaningful or just aesthetically beautiful. That was yeah. neither. It was <laughs> neither. You know, when ask a goldsmith art student if they know why they just made that thing, and they'll tell you, dude, yeah. I don't know what it is. You know, that pig is producing work better than the goldsmith's art student. You anyway. sound like an old person. And I hope they're watching. Anyway, uh, that's all we've got time for, I'm afraid. So let's have another quick look at Thursday's front pages. And they're mostly going with the budget. The Times, we're turning the corner. The Telegraph, Hunt signals the end of national insurance. And The Guardian, a last desperate act. And The Express goes the other way. Britain ready for takeoff. The iNews has Labour rules out taxing wealthy to avoid £20 billion cuts. And finally, The Daily Star, apparently fry-ups turn blokes into stud muffins. That's all we've got time for. Thanks ever so much <laughs> to my guests, Scott Caporo mm. and Nick Dixon. Of course, we are going to be back tomorrow at 11 o'clock with some other comedians who I can't remember at the moment. And, by the way, if you're watching the 5am repeat, please do stick around because now it's time for breakfast. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Hi there, welcome to the latest GB News forecast from the Met Office. Yeah, there was some warm, sunny spells during Wednesday, but for many over the next 24 hours, it is going to be cloudy with an increased chance of showers developing through Thursday. We've got high pressure to the east. That's bringing a lot of low cloud into eastern parts. We keep the clear spells overnight in the south and the west. Where we do have the clear spells, there'll be a touch of frost and some fog patches forming. A few showers continuing across parts of Cornwall as well. Otherwise, many places will be dry. And we start the day with a bit of a chill in the air, certainly where we've got those frost and fog pockets in the west but it will soon warm up. The cloud will lift as well, and actually, with the rising cloud, it's going to be a brighter day across northeastern parts of the UK. Still a lot of cloud, and that cloud bubbling up, some sharp showers will develop, particularly through the Midlands, East Wales, into later on parts of northern England. Away from the showers, though, plenty of dry and bright weather, best of the sunshine in the west and southwest, highs of 12 or 13 Celsius, although still a chill in the east. And it's going to be increasingly breezy through Thursday and into Friday. That breeze coming from the east will make it feel on the cold side, but increasingly sunny spells will develop in the south on Friday and it's going to be largely dry. Same can't be said for the weekend. Increasingly spells of showery rain will move north across the country, 8 Celsius in the north, 12 further south. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. We have a ton of top prizes to be won in our spring giveaway. There's a massive £12,345 in tax-free cash to spend however you like, along with £500 in shopping vouchers for your favourite store, a games console, a pizza oven, and a portable Sonos smart speaker. And the best news? You could be our next big winner, just like Phil. Whoever wins it next is going to be 
as happy as I was. And they're going to get even more money this time around, so why wouldn't you go in the draw? For your chance to win the vouchers, the treats, and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text PRIZE to 84902. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 double T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There'll be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Every Wednesday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions when Rishi Sunak and Sir Keir Starmer go head to head in the House of Commons. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. responses from members of the audience but before all of that let's get the news back in London from Polly Middlehurst Nigel, thank you, and good evening to you. Well, the Chancellor has cut national insurance in today's pre-election budget, but opposition leaders say living standards are still squeezed and millions of people face being dragged into higher tax bans. Jeremy Hunt said today the government's fiscal performance means the economy is expected, though, to grow this year by 0.8%, giving, he says, the government enough headroom to make the cut to national insurance contributions. From April the 6th, employee national insurance will be cut by another 2p from 10% to 8%. And self-employed national insurance will be cut from 8% to 6%. It means an additional £450 a year for the average employee or £350 for someone self-employed. When combined with the autumn reductions, it means 27 million employees will get an average tax cut of £900 a year. 
Well, also in the budget today, the non-DOM tax status will be scrapped, with tax breaks for wealthy foreign residents replaced by what the Chancellor called a modern residency system. Also in the budget, rounding out today's announcements, pubs will get a boost from a freeze on alcohol duty. And... Child benefit threshold going up from 60, up to £60,000. And the five pence cut to fuel duty is locked in for another 12 months. Also, the VAT registration threshold goes up to £90,000 from 85, while the pensions regulator will get new powers ensuring people with defined contributions are getting value from their investments. And there's a new ISA scheme with a £5,000 yearly allowance for British assets. As well as one more point for you, IT systems in the NHS getting a £3.5 million upgrade. Well, in other news today, the science secretary is facing calls to quit after taxpayers covered her £15,000 bill in damages and legal fees following her false accusations that she made about an academic. Michelle Donnellan, who has now retracted her comments, accused Professor Kate Sang of supporting the terrorist group Hamas. However, an investigation found the claims were baseless. Labour says Ms Donnellan's false accusations are a new low in government standards. And lastly, in the United States, where Nikki Haley has ended her long-shot challenge against Donald Trump to become the Republican candidate for president. The former governor of South Carolina dropped out today, just a day after Super Tuesday, with Donald Trump beating her in 14 out of 15 contests. In her speech earlier on today, she declined to endorse Donald Trump, but did wish him well in what looks to be a rematch with Democrat Joe Biden in November's US election. For the very latest stories, do sign up for GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code that comes up on your screen now and again. It's not there right now, but it will pop up at some point. Or you can go to gbnews.com slash alerts. But now it's live to Cumbria for Farage. Yes, I'm here in Cumbria. I'm in Whitehaven. Following on from Michelle Dubry, we've got a big live, energetic, enthusiastic audience. Well, they're enthusiastic about being at a GB News show. As to whether they're enthusiastic about the budget, well, that remains to be seen. Now, this was supposed to be a really big moment for this government, perhaps even if it's accepted by the public very well, a precursor to a general election that could happen, according to some, as early as May the 2nd. So, at 12.30, up got the Chancellor of the Exchequer. His opening sentence, I simply could not believe. Here it is. As we mourn the tragic loss of life in Israel and Gaza, the Prime Minister reminded us last week of the need to fight extremism and heal divisions. So I start today by remembering the Muslims who died in two world wars in the service of freedom and democracy. We need a memorial to honour them, so following representations from the Right Honourable Member for Bromsgrove and others, I've decided to allocate £1 million towards the cost of building one. Whatever your faith or colour or class, this country will never forget the sacrifices made for our future. Yeah. Well, here is my response. I went to the local cemetery here in Whitehaven, where there were nearly 80 people buried who died in two world wars, pilots, people washed up on the shores here in Cumbria, others who'd come back from the front and died of wounds. Here is my response to what he had to say. Over a hundred years ago, we had men of more brain and foresight than our Chancellor. They decided at the end of the First World War, and we continued it throughout World War II as well, that everybody, regardless of race, rank or religion, would be buried beneath the same headstone. The principle was equality in death, recognising the contribution of all. And indeed, if you go to a big Commonwealth war grave cemetery in France or elsewhere, what you'll see is a stone of remembrance that says, for those of all faiths and none. We thought about this over a hundred years ago. We do not need Jeremy Hunt putting forward the idea of a memorial to a specific religion. It is just plain wrong. I feel very strong about this. I really, really do. 
It is Sajid Javid that was pushing for this memorial, but it shows a total lack of understanding of really how brilliant our leaders were 100 years ago at recognising everybody. We were to be unified in death and equal in death. Whether you won a Victoria Cross, didn't matter. Didn't matter who you were, what you were, you, sat, you had exactly the same headstone. But it says so much, I think, about modern-day politics. We try to pander to each individual group, rather than saying everybody in our country should be equal. Now, moving on, of course, this was the great tax-cutting budget. Yes, tuppence more off national insurance. And I'm going to drill down in a moment with Mark Littlewood as to whether people really are paying less tax. But moving on, one of the big statements of the budget was that after all these years, the government is going to sell its stake, its remaining stake, nearly 38%, in National Westminster Bank. <laughs> now, it's fair to say that I have some degree of interest in this subject. <laughs> And we, own a, we still own about £7 billion quid's worth of NatWest shares. And the idea is the government sells these shares, retail investors, such as people in this room, will buy the shares at a discounted price. Uh, but I have a problem with that, and I did put out a tweet shortly afterwards saying, until the NatWest group provides full disclosure and apologises for their behaviour and their cover-ups, why should any retail customer trust them? So, Mr Hunt... If you want to get about seven billion quid back for the Treasury uh, to help you balance the books, you better make sure that NatWest, which you at the moment are the major shareholder in, honour their obligations to me, stop the cover-up, stop the lies, start telling the truth. And I tell you what, if they think they're going to go ahead with this share sale and I'm going to sit on the sidelines and say nothing until the wrongs have been righted, you know what? I quite like a fight. <laughs> and <laughs> what I did notice was that this was an extraordinarily political budget. To be fair to Hunt, he delivered it pretty well. And he did make one or two quite funny jokes, especially at the expense of Angela Rayner <laughs> over those that own second properties. That really was genuinely quite funny. But political in the sense that what were the constituencies that he named in the budget. Bromsgrove, Stoke-on-Trent, Dudley North, Whitham, Loughborough, South End West, Rother Valley, Vale of Cluid, St Austell and Newquay, North Devon, I could go on. He mentioned 19 constituencies that would benefit from this budget. And guess what? Every single one of them are seats held by Conservatives where they worry they might lose the seats at the next general election. So it was an overtly political budget. But he also made a statement that I thought was really, really interesting. And it was about immigration, and it was about wages and gross domestic product. Listen in. If we want that growth to lead to higher wages and higher living standards for every family in every corner of the country, it cannot come from unlimited migration. It can only come by building a high-wage, high-skill economy. Not just higher GDP, but higher GDP per head. And that, and that, from the Chancellor of a Conservative Party that have overseen record levels of legal immigration into Britain and where gross domestic product per head is falling. We are getting poorer. Now, the arguments he made are the arguments that I've made publicly for many, many years. And that, perhaps, is my biggest problem with this budget. In fact, my biggest problem with the last 14 years of these people, they pretend to be one thing when actually they are quite another. Whether tuppence of national insurance, whether making statements like that is enough to have suddenly a surge in the polls for the Conservative Party and a, a bold step to a 2nd of May general election, I don't know. But, folks, I've got to tell you, somehow, I really rather doubt it. Now, to the main claim in the budget. There was one really extraordinary statement. And don't forget, 2P was taken off last October. Didn't give them much electoral benefit. So they have reduced 
the level of national insurance. They've hinted they might get rid of national insurance and make it cleaner and simpler that you pay through income tax. But this statement was the biggest claim of the budget. Hunt said, the personal taxes paid by a median earner as a proportion of their income in 2024-25 are the lowest they've been since 1975. Now that is, I would put it to you, Mark Littlewood, Director of Popcorn and former Director of the Institute of Economic Affairs, that is a very big, bold statement. That is saying anybody in this room that is earning you know, an average mean salary is paying less tax than anyone for nearly 50 years. Wow, they must be doing rather well. Well, Jeremy Hunt seems to think so. Here's the problem, though, Nigel, as you'll know well. If you're listening to an economist or a politician, always read the fine print. And it's the important fine print in what Jeremy Hunt said. I believe he's technically correct. He mentions personal taxes. So he's measuring your national insurance and your income tax contributions. And if you're an average earner, given everything he's done, that might be down a bit. But that's not what the average earner thinks about. They think about their overall take-home pay. So, I don't know, if you smoke tobacco, you'll be paying a lot more in tax in a different fashion. If your council tax is going up, you're paying a lot more in tax in a different fashion. I wouldn't think most people in this room, Nigel, care specifically about what their personal taxes are. They care about their overall tax bill. And the fact there is, unfortunately, I have to confess, after 14 years of Conservative government, it's at its highest since the 19. 40s. And I think it will be pretty, uh, not much sucker to people in this room and in other constituencies like it to be told on a technicality their personal taxes are down when the overall tax burden is up. And that's the fact of the matter. Yeah, and he sold this idea that we're not going to have the fuel duty escalator put on, that we're not going to have increased alcohol taxes, and somehow you're all better off. But all he was really doing was not putting taxes up. Yes, exactly. That's, that, unfortunately, is what governments now pat themselves on the back for. You know, great news, your taxes haven't gone up. Well, I think there's a good number of people in this room and elsewhere who actually want to see their taxes go down. And this is also in the context, remember, Nigel, where the economy's flatlining. Look, if we were all getting richer, I don't know, 5 6% a year, seeing our wages go up every year, seeing prices fall in the shops, well, at that point, you might not struggle too much if your tax yeah. bill's another 100 quid. But because there hasn't been growth in the economy, uh, people are really, really feeling that pinch. So we've become, we've drifted into becoming a high-tax, high-spend, heavily regulated, social democratic economy after 14 years of Conservative government. That's quite a disappointment, and I don't think he did enough today to U-turn from that. And that said, by Mark Littlewood, a member of the Conservative Party. Yeah, exactly. Oh, dear, they really are in trouble, aren't they? <laughs> well, look, I mean, look... I mean, here we are. They are. I mean, we're, we're in the red wall. We've taken some straw polls of this audience. Uh, I, yeah. I think, you know, this may be a day late and a dollar short. You, you know, I do read the opinion polls. The Conservative Party is not popular at all. Uh, is there a road back? I don't know. But the only road back is that you need to be honest with people and you need to start to get a government off their back and you need to start doing the right thing by ordinary hard-working Brits. And it's difficult to discern that thread running through government policy over recent years. Mark Littlewood, thank you very much indeed. In a moment, we'll get a reaction, we'll see what Sakir had to say and we'll get a reaction from a Labour MP. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Big news, big debate, big opinion, 
Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you... PMQ's Live, here on GB News. Every Wednesday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's Questions, when Rishi Sunak and Sir Keir Starmer go head-to-head -head in the House of Commons. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live, here on GB News, Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Okay, a minor change of plan. We're actually going to go to the local Member of Parliament first. Trudy Harrison MP was elected here in Copeland in a by-election back in 2017. And it was a pretty big national by-election. She held the seat in the 17 election and increased her majority again in the 2019 general election. So there's been a Conservative Member of Parliament sitting for this constituency for the last three elections. And that of itself is actually pretty remarkable because this part of Cumbria had been represented by Labour since way before World War II. And Trudy joins me right now in front of her constituents here in Copeland. Now, thus far, thus far, we've talked about the budget, we've talked about the proposals put forward by Jeremy Hunt. Thus far, this lot don't seem to be all that impressed. Um, how would you assess today's budget? Um, I got the memo. Stick into the plan, don't want to go back to square one. Yes, we've ticked many of the boxes. Growth is up slightly. Better than Germany, better than France, oh, better than Italy. I thought we were in recession. But it's still up. And inflation is <laughs> well, down. Well, I mean, I mean, you're right, you're right. Actually, in one way, you're right. We are doing better than France and Germany and Italy, um, and, and Brexit, clearly hasn't damaged us, but, but being better than those basket cases isn't that good of itself, is it, really? And there is more to do. But I think in this particular neck of the woods, we are quite unique. For example, the national average wage is 31,000. Here, it's 49,000. And we are in a, a particularly strong nuclear economy, which really holds us in a strong place. So the best bit for me is when Rishi mentioned nuclear, because that is what we actually Yeah, and that was one of the reasons, on. Trudy, wasn't it? One of the reasons that you stood for that by-election... Absolutely. ..that you got Head involved with shoulders, politics is obviously wind-scale as it was, cellar yeah. field as it is now. Just how many jobs does that provide for this part of the country? About 27,000. There's about 80,000 nuclear workers in the country, and of those, about 27,000 work in this area. Nobody does nuclear better than we do in West Cumbria. We've got seven reactors. Nowhere else is there that concentration of reactors and all of the processes around not just Sellafield, but also the supply chain as well. And that's why we have such a high average wage. But coupled with the fact that we also have relatively affordable houses, the average house price is about 310,000 and ours is about 155,000. It's a good place to live. 
Yeah, well, you could get a flood of people now moving in after those comments. <laughs> and you might not be thankful, we need I don't to, know. <laughs> because the worst thing for our area is actually we are the fastest decline in population in England, declining at a rate of about 5%. And even more scarily is the fact that Barrow is the second fastest decline in local authority. So it's Cumbria, it's this coast. It's West Cumbria, yeah. We went through a period, really, of almost 20 years with no clearly defined nuclear policy. Oh, we had one. You it know. was switch it off and knock it down. Yeah, yeah. But, but it's OK, because, I mean, Boris told us that wind turbines might solve all of our problems. And you were his PPS, weren't you? Well, there cannot have been a day when I didn't tell Boris, nuclear will do that. When we were talking about levelling up and you want jobs outside of London and the South East, nuclear does that. Now, it seems that, I mean... When you want apprenticeships, yeah. nuclear no, does no, that. I mean, I get all of that. It seems that we now have a nuclear policy from the Conservative government. Hunt was very warm mm. about potentially the next generation of nuclear reactors. I mean, equally, I think Labour are in the same place too, aren't they? Well, they've had a bit of a change, but I don't particularly believe it. I'm rather nervous that it's hard enough. You know, the Conservatives have switched on every nuclear power station this country has ever had. And it's hard enough for us to get new nuclear going. We've got Hinkley Point C. I very much hope that we get Rolls-Royce, small modular reactors in our area as well. But it's really difficult getting anything done. Yeah, and they're long-term decisions. But what's interesting, Trudy, is this, that, you know, your government, you know, and you've been with them through this net-zero mania. I mean, Boris was addicted to it. Uh, they are rowing back ever so slightly on one or two areas... But isn't it extraordinary that here we are in this part of the country, which has been associated with energy for centuries, mm. whether it's coal or nuclear? Mm. I mean, this is where it's been at very for, so. for a very, very long time. And a couple of years ago, the approval was given for a new open-cast coal mine yeah. Yeah. in this constituency, producing high-quality coal, very important coal for steelmaking, grade, yeah. grade A, for many other things. And yet, it seems... The budget is going to maintain super taxes on those that invest in oil and gas in the North Sea. Why is this coal mine, given that it was approved, still not open? It was approved locally three times by the then Cumbria County Council. It was then called in and the government, I think it was the 7th of December 2022, then agreed it again but it's tied up currently in a legal tangle, which is, I think, why so much of our infrastructure does get held up. But, you know, despite being an environment minister, despite being a decarbonisation minister in transport and mm. the chair of the environment APPG, I am fully behind extracting this critical raw material in the cleanest, greenest way possible, not to mention the amount of private sector investment. And I think that's often lost on people. This is all private sector Trudy, investment. it's all well and good to say that, but, you know, the government is pushing for net zero, mm -hmm. right? Net zero means pushing up the price of electricity for these people in this room by subsidising uh, wind energy, perhaps being the, clear, you know, the clearest example of that, and by de-industrializing. We close down manufacturing plant, we say, hooray, we're producing less carbon dioxide, that business now goes and, it, and the stuff is manufactured in China or India. Do you support net zero? We have four times more manufacturing in this area. Do you support net zero? I support decarbonisation. You do? But I do think... And if that, that means deindustrialisation, that's fine. So, I, I also think that the ten-point plan for a green industrial revolution was quite exciting, but every single part of it needs steel. So whether you want to build nuclear <coughs> power stations, small ones, advanced ones, or gigawatt plus, if you want to build wind turbines, if you want to transition towards electric vehicles, which are a lot faster than the combustion engine. You can't deny a Tesla Roadster at 1.9 seconds, not to 60, is pretty impressive. Well, given the number of speed cameras that have been put up in the last few years, what's the point of it anyway? I mean, you can't go anywhere without being flashed, it seems to But me. it will all need steel. <laughs> Plus, I'm going back from here to Kent tonight, and EV's not much good to me, is it, really? Because I need to stop for half an hour somewhere. I recommend T-Bay. Definitely the best service station in the country. Right, the well, I, 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 don't, I can't answer to that. I, I, I will trust your knowledge. Here's my point. That on the one hand, the government says it wants to be pro-business. On the other hand, it is, you know, absolutely committed to net zero. We're about to close primary steel production in South Wales. 
We're about to lose primary steel production, I think, up on the Humber. With the world as it is, with perhaps the greatest external potential military threat that we've seen certainly in 60 years and maybe even in 80 years, this country under a Conservative government is about to become a country that doesn't produce any primary steel. And all of it... <laughs> and all of it to meet net zero targets. And I just think the public well, are very that confused. Is utter rubbish, because I think it's war-grade hypocrisy not to produce coking coal from this country and of course we should be producing steel as well not least because there isn't enough old steel knocking about in the world to put into electric car furnaces to create the recycled steel but also for a precise engineering aerospace nuclear defense we're going to need the virgin steel as well so on that no. i completely agree no, with i know you. i know and yet one of the reasons why We've reduced our carbon emissions more than any other Western country as we've lost so much of this business. Well, we talk a good game on where we are with um, our energy uh, decarbonisation, but actually only 17% of our energy makeup is electricity. The remaining 83% is heat and transport, so we've got a way to go. And that's another brilliant thing about nuclear, because we can power the electrolyzers to produce the hydrogen to go into the hydrogen on vehicles that, that, that won't run I on am, batteries. On the, and, of course, it produces no carbon emissions. On that, I'm 100%. It is the brilliant. only proven large-scale... Yeah. Uh, zero carbon generation that will work It'll anywhere work. in the world 24 no, I hours, get it. 7 I get days it. a week I get it, well let's hope they do push on uh, both parties, whoever's in government next time and do it. Finally, you know you got involved in politics because you're a local campaigner, local woman you care about stuff, this is this area is in your blood, I know it is, I've been talking yeah, to you earlier I love it. you've done your bit I know there's a few constituency changes, boundary changes going on up here uh, but that's it, you're done, you're off, you're retiring No, 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 I I'm leaving Parliament because, unlike you, Nigel, I'm a bit fed up of politics. But I think the national policies are there or thereabouts. But I worry that in this area we won't be able to, you know, capitalise on the benefits of those national policies. As a minister, I would go to the Oxford, Cambridge, London triangle and see how those areas were really switched on with their business community and the local councils. I want us to be like that. All right, really you're, so you're back to being a local campaign, is really what you're saying. I'm always going to be an activist. Right, well, you've done your bit, you've done your bit, you've done your time, some would say. Last question. You were PPS to one Boris Johnson. What was I that was. like? I was. Well, do you know what? I didn't get a peerage, but I got 24 gigawatts. I'm happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> Trudy Harrison, thank you very much indeed. For thank you. On GB News. We'll take a break. In a minute, back with the Labour reaction. Twenty twenty four, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise and who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In twenty twenty four, GB News is Britain's election channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you... PMQ's Live here on GB News. Every Wednesday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's Questions when Rishi Sunak and Sir Keir Starmer go head-to-head -head in the House of Commons. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels 
we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Of course. We were all waiting for the response in the House of Commons. Now, I thought Rachel Reeves, the Shadow Chancellor, might respond to Jeremy Hunt, but no, it was Sir Keir Starmer, the leader of the Labour Party, and this is just a little snapshot of what he had to say. There we have it, the last desperate act of a party that has failed. Yeah! Britain in recession. The national credit card maxed out. And despite the measures today, the highest tax burden for 70 years. Yeah. The first Parliament since records began to see living standards fall, confirmed by this budget today. That is their record. Yeah. It is still their record. Give with one hand and take even more with the yeah. other. And nothing they do between now and the election will change that. Yeah. Well, Keir Starmer there in a pretty confident mood, I thought. Well, let's go and speak to Lloyd Russell-Moyle, Labour Member of Parliament for Brighton and uh, Peacehaven. And I have to say, uh, Lloyd, I want to hear your thoughts on this budget, but I particularly want to hear... I particularly want to hear why you think a Labour government might be better. So, without hesitation, repetition or deviation, give us your take, please. Well, my take is that this is a budget that doesn't go to deal with any of the systemic issues in society. We have a cost of living crisis. We have a crisis particularly for adult social care that's causing a lot of our councils to go bankrupt up and down the country of all political flavours. We have crises in our schools. And none of those things were addressed by this budget. In fact, we also have a crisis that the squeeze middle have a high tax burden now, much higher than we have had for a generation, and it doesn't really go after people who have the broadest shoulders. Yes, the Chancellor took on some of our policies on the non-DOMs, but actually that won't come in for two years anyway, and it won't come in until after the election, so it's all nice words. Um, he, he has suggested changes on national insurance. I actually agree with some, what some of the Chancellor was saying, that national insurance is a regressive tax. It should be better rolled into income tax so that people, of whatever your income is, are paying a fair share. But none of the wider reforms that he proposed um, will actually come in until after the election. This budget was generally a budget of, I will do something very meagre now, and I will promise to do something far-reaching in the future, in the never-never, Manana, manana. And that's effectively what the IFS has said as well. In the, all the future parts of the budget are complete fantasy. They're not costed and they're not worked out. What Labour will do is actually make those reforms on business rates that we know small businesses need uh, so that people are paying a fairer amount. We will make sure that we increase the threshold so that people effectively aren't put into tax for no reason, just because inflation has gone up, but they have not actually um, earning really in real terms a penny more, but are paying more tax. We will make those changes so tax is fairer. That is the basis of the Labour proposal. And so it will be better under Labour for the ordinary person, for the working person. And that is what, um, at the moment, this country, um, uh, people who are suffering. 
Well, I agree with you that jam tomorrow was a very big message from this budget. But from your analysis there, it sounds to me that what you're saying is that Labour will spend even more money on public services than this government currently is. We will spend better on public services. So, for example, local government, let's talk about the crisis there. Rather than a cash settlement that happens every year, means local government is scrabbling around for money, drawing down lots of bits of pots where they spend hours and hours of time writing the bids for central government to say yay or nay, like some Emperor Nero with the thumbs up or thumbs down. Labour will give a fair funding formula, will give fixed amounts of money to local governments for five years. So local areas can properly decide to invest and then recoup their money. And we believe that is a more responsible way to run government. So it's not just about giving more cash, but it's about giving cash responsibly in ways that allows our services to recover. That's the difference a Labour government will make, yes. Lloyd Russell, thank you for joining us live tonight on GB News, giving us your reaction to the budget. Thank you very thank you. much indeed. Now, now, the most important part of this programme, after the break, it is, of course, Barrage the Farage, where I get your questions and your thoughts on what happened today in the budget and, more generally, where we are as a country. Back with Barrage the Farage in just a moment. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you... PMQ's Live here on GB News. Every Wednesday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's Questions when Rishi Sunak and Sir Keir Starmer go head-to-head -head in the House of Commons. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. No more elected politicians, nobody else here on this show selling party policy. No, this is the really important bit. This is the reaction for people here in Whitehaven. <laughs> Come on, Gary. Let's get on with it, shall we? <laughs> Hi, Nigel. 
Do you think that this budget was meant to be a sweetener for the electorate in election year? Yes, I do, actually. And I thought, you know, as I said earlier, 19 parliamentary constituencies were mentioned. Oh, there's money for this and money for that. I've listened to this member and that member. And I think it was designed perhaps to give them an option as to whether they might go on May the 2nd. So they're hoping for a big uplift from the budget because they're cutting taxes. But, you know, we sat here with Mark Littlewood earlier on who yeah. said, even though we appear to have these cuts, actually, the overall tax burden, because we pay tax through other means, you know, through duties, etc., um, is the highest for 70 years. So, yes, I think they were giving... My suspicion is this now. I don't think there's going to be a big positive reaction to this budget at all. I think they're going to run this election right through to November or later, and I'll bet so you... So do I. I'll bet you there's an awesome statement with more so-called giveaways. <laughs> You're with me on this, yeah? I am, yeah. I totally agree. I think we'll run to um, the end of the year for the election. Uh, but it was good to hear the Conservatives talking about tax cuts again, but I don't think it's going to make a difference. OK, Gary, thank you very much thank indeed. You. Yeah, well, it's <laughs> always nice to hear good things, but, uh, Brian... Brian, good evening. Good evening, Nigel. If you had been Chancellor today, would you have increased the tax-free allowance from 12,500 to 20,000 to help all those low-paid workers? I, do you know one thing that amazed me? For the first time in years, they lifted the threshold at which small traders start paying VAT, having to charge and process VAT. But it went from 85,000 a year to 90,000 a year. Kind of, why bother? Yeah. <laughs> you know? And I'm sure there are a lot of people running little businesses who would much rather stay outside the VAT sure. regime. Um, look, I, I think the problem we've got is that for many people in, living in certain circumstances, going to work does not pay. It does not pay. You know, 5.4 million people of working age just not working at all, um, and we've been relying on migrant labour whilst British people haven't done the jobs. Now, you know, there's obviously a carrot and stick needed here. You know, we clearly have to get tough on those that are claiming benefits that, frankly, are sponging. It's not everybody, you know. Please don't condemn me. I'm not having to go at everybody. <laughs> the, you know, society wants to look after its weakest. But we also have to incentivise work. So, yes, I think the single most important thing they could have done today is to significantly lift that tax threshold to make work really pay. Definitely. Um, what other tax would you like to see changed? Well, we'd all like income tax to come down, but, again, as Gary said, I think that's just a sweetener for whatever, whenever the well, election comes. And here's the interesting thing. 40p tax, it came down to 40p in 1988. It stayed at 40p top rate all through Blair's years. Through that time, one and a half million people were paying 40% tax. Mm -hmm. Under Hunt's plans, by the end of 2027, 8 million will be paying 40p or more yeah. tax. And they tell us we're better off. <laughs> Brian, thank you very Thanks much indeed. Job. Thank you. <laughs> Karen. Hello. Hi, Nigel. I'm a huge fan. Oh, that's very kind of you. Thank you. <laughs> Don't make me blush and go all red. <laughs> we live in Kendall, Cumbria. Yeah. Do you think the impact of second home ownership in Cumbria is having an effect on the local housing supply? Look, second homes do, of course, have an effect on the local housing supply, but equally, those that come and buy second homes sometimes are wealthier people from the big cities, in this case probably Manchester, in my part of the world, London, um, and they do also spend more money and inject money into the local economy. So it's really, really difficult. I know the lakes are enormously popular for second homes, and certainly in places like Cornwall, Norfolk, other areas like that, there's been a total distortion of the market and a complete shortage of housing, and prices have gone through the roof. But, you know, here's the thing. Here's the thing. I have seen one Cornish village where they've had a new housing development, and they've literally only sold those new houses to people who live locally, you know, pay council tax locally, work locally. So I think to ban people from buying second homes because they happen to be more fortunate financially. That's not the way a free market works. I don't think we can afford to do that. Now, there's clearly the tax they're going to pay now has gone up as of today, but I think we need to adopt a different approach, which is house building that is actually for local people. That, to me, is the only possible, sensible way forward. And by the way, 
if mass legal immigration wasn't running at the numbers it was, that has, a, that has a far bigger impact yeah, yeah. on housing Absolutely. than second houses anyway. Yeah, yeah. OK, let's Hi, go. Nigel. Nick, hello. Hello, how are you? All right. I like your desk. Um, <laughs> well, my question has been slightly hijacked by somebody with dues, but what's your take on the fact that in this budget, he was giving out money to all the areas, the North East, he even talked about devolution of the North East, but the North West was totally neglected. Yeah, you're right. There's a huge emphasis on the North East. It's because they see Ben Houch and their mayor up in Teesside as being their sort of poster boy, I guess. I mean, you know, the whole concept of levelling up, uh, the idea that you just chuck money at the North and somehow by chucking money, life's going to get better. I don't believe the economy works like that. I often think when government chucks money in different areas, it gets misspent, it goes to all the wrong people. I think what really matters, what genuinely matters, is creating the right conditions for business. I would say, in fairness, that there was a commitment made today towards the nuclear industry, which would benefit Sellafield, which would benefit this area, if it actually comes to pass. I would disagree on that. Go on, tell me why. First of all, we wanted the um, advanced modular nuclear yep. here. Yep. And it should be done by English company, not Westinghouse or some other. But it was given to Teesside. So, again, we don't get nuclear yeah. here. Yeah. The previous people who were going to do nuclear here dropped out and the whole thing collapsed at Moorside. So, uh, basically, we are basically being quietly neglected while they move all this kind of thing into the areas where I think they've got better links, better transport, more money. Now, I think, look, Nick, overall, you raise a fair point. Massive emphasis on the North East, very little said about the North West. That is a very, very fair point. Thank you. Thanks very much. <laughs> OK. We have another Nigel in the room. <laughs> Bad From luck. Alverston, what a great place. <laughs> Which is the home of Stan Laurel, just in case, I know. Just in case you didn't I know. know. I know. For anybody know. else listening. Um, Nigel, I work in the shipyard down in Barrow, and we build the nuclear deterrent. The submarine business is, is great for the area. What I'd like to know is, will the next government carry on and support the submarine business, and will it support the shipyard? OK, we're assuming here a Labour government. First thing to say is that the AUKUS Hopefully deal... Hopefully not. Well, well, <laughs> I, I think given the opinion polls today, it's not a bad assumption to make. The AUKUS deal has been one of the big successes of Brexit. There have been too few successes of Brexit. Uh, too few businesses feel that the, the, the burden of regulation has been lifted from them. In fact, in many ways, some think it's worse. Uh, the promise to control our borders... Well, I mean, six more boats crossed the English Channel today, uh, and we've got legal immigration as well. But the AUKUS deal was done. We could <laughs> That would not have happened as members of the European Union. So we are going to, you know... We're going to have a significant role in building nuclear submarines that the Australians will use. Um, my slight worry, and Barrow, of course, as you know, has, has led the way with this engineering for decade after decade. Since the 1900s. Yeah, no, no, absolutely, building submarines here for the First World War, let alone yeah. Trident. Every today. submarine, I think, that's been built in the, the, the British Navy has been made in Barrow. Yeah. I'm told the Trident fleet is uh, kind of a bit tired at the moment. Um, not, at, at times, not all of them are operational. So the future prospects for work in Barrow are very, very good indeed if an incoming Labour government sticks with those policies. Yeah. Do you know what? Do you know what? I... The Labour Party tore themselves to pieces back in the 1980s over this issue. I do not believe there will be a change to that policy under Labour. That's good news. All right, thank you, thank you, thank you very much indeed. <laughs> OK. Time for two more. We have got Jack Hawley. Jack. Hi, Nigel. Good evening. So, with the government removing the non-DOM tax and the phantom tax today, um, with all of the gains for the wealthy, when will the government stop focusing on the wealthy, making them richer, and start focusing on the average person? I... <laughs> I don't really agree with that, Jack, and I'll tell you why. The top 1% of taxpayers in Britain pay 30% of our taxes, all right? We need those people to stay in our country. 
And if we send the wrong messages, they're so mobile, they can literally, at the press of a button, move their money overseas and hop on a private plane and go. And whilst, of course, you're right, the emphasis must be on, you know, helping people get on and advance in life. And we were asked a question about that earlier on, about raising tax thresholds to make work pay. And it's funny, isn't it? You work, you earn money, you feel good about it, you maybe want to work harder and make more money and then pay more tax ultimately. So I, I think this anti-rich narrative, Jack, it doesn't work for me. Um, and already we're seeing people leaving Britain. We have the biggest brain drain we've had since the 1970s, and people are leaving because taxes are going up. So I would say this to you, you know, th there are always unfairnesses in life. Some people have a lot more money than others. Some are born in different circumstances to others. I just think that if we go on with this attitude of wanting to tax the rich and they leave the country, we'll all be worse off. Yeah, but with, with taxing the rich more, when will the taxes from the rich start to come into the local areas? So like the North West, because the tax is nothing. <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't work like that. The tax goes into a central pot. It doesn't go into individual areas. I promise you, Jack, if you start taxing the rich more, they will leave the country and we will be poorer. And I really, really believe that. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> OK. The final question Hi. goes to Charles. Hi. Um, so do you think if Rachel Reeves had been giving the budget statement uh, today instead of Jeremy Hunt, she would have been able to do anything differently? It's a good question. And I think it was very interesting. I, I listened to the end, the end of uh, Michelle Jubry's show. Um, and I think both Aaron Bastani, very much from a left-wing perspective, uh, you know, and Mark, very much more from a sort of centre-right perspective, basically agreed at the end of her show that we have two big state, high-tax, social democrat parties. It's quite difficult to tell them apart on most issues. And as the election comes, they'll play up whatever differences there are. I don't believe they're that great. What do you think? No, I think uh, they're painted into a corner, aren't they? Uh, it seems that no-one has any money to spend. So if a Labour government gets in, I suspect they will keep a steady state for a few years and then they'll revert to the, their type and, and try and just raise taxes, spend more money, uh, increase the debt. So that would be my concern, my worry. Well, you may well be right, but I mean, remember that when the Conservatives came to power, the accumulated national debt was pushing on for a trillion. It's now 2.6 trillion. And Hunt stands up and tells us they're cutting the debt, they're, they're cutting the debt and we're all supposed to believe it. Uh, do you know what? I think those of us old enough in this room to remember the 1970s, to remember the absolute mess the economy was in, remember that the only way out of this is growth. The only way out of this is lots of you setting up businesses, taking risks, working hard, earning money, employing people, paying tax. We need growth. And I don't see anything, frankly, Charles, from either party that inspires me to think that any of them have frankly got a clue how small business and entrepreneurship works. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, this evening for joining me here. And I'm going to give one last mention to Whitehaven. <laughs> they love it. Let's now get the weather with Ada McGiven. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hi there, welcome to the latest GB News forecast from the Met Office. Yeah, there was some warm, sunny spells during Wednesday, but for many over the next 24 hours, it is going to be cloudy with an increased chance of showers developing through Thursday. We've got high pressure to the east. That's bringing a lot of low cloud into eastern parts. We keep the clear spells overnight in the south and the west. Where we do have the clear spells, there'll be a touch of frost and some fog patches forming. A few showers continuing across parts of Cornwall as well. Otherwise, many places will be dry. And we start the day with a bit of a chill in the air, certainly where we've got those frost and fog pockets in the west but it will soon warm up. The cloud will lift as well, and actually, with the rising cloud, it's going to be a brighter day across northeastern parts of the UK. Still a lot of cloud, and that cloud bubbling up, some sharp showers will develop, particularly through the Midlands, East Wales, into later on parts of northern England. 
Away from the showers, though, plenty of dry and bright weather. Best of the sunshine in the west and southwest. Highs of 12 or 13 Celsius, although still a chill in the east. So it's going to be increasingly breezy through Thursday and into Friday. That breeze coming from the east will make it feel on the cold side, but increasingly sunny spells will develop in the south on Friday and it's going to be largely dry. Same can't be said for the weekend. Increasingly spells of showery rain will move north across the country. 8 Celsius in the north, 12 further south. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar. Sponsors of weather on GB News. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's Live here on GB News. Every Wednesday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's Questions when Rishi Sunak and Sir Keir Starmer go head to head in the House of Commons. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We 